the impact of tax reform on trusts after divorce. That's the subject of today's ActTech Trust and Estate Talk. Welcome to ActTech Trust and Estate Talk from the American College of Trust and Estate Counsel, a professional society of peer elected trust and estate lawyers. This series offers professionals best practice advice, insights, and commentary on subjects that affect our profession and clients. To keep up with the changing world of wealth planning, subscribe at iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or other podcast sites. And now, our ActTech fellow host with today's topic. This is Margaret Van Houten of Des Moines, Iowa. Recent changes can have an enormous impact on existing trusts after divorce. To give us more information on this topic, you will be hearing today from ActTech fellow Justin Miller of San Francisco. Welcome, Justin. Thank you very much. As many of us are hopefully aware, we had what's commonly referred to as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or you could call it TICJA for short. And uh, what it did was um, make some big changes that could really impact existing trust that spouses may have created for each other, and the impact could happen if and when they were to ever get divorced. Um, What I'm also going to talk about, if you stay till the end of this podcast, is a way that trust can actually be your friend in divorce. But first, I'm going to start with a little bit of background and where do these changes come from. At this point, everybody should be aware that uh, the alimony rules have been repealed. This was a topic of a previous podcast, and really, it only applies to a divorce or separation instruments entered into as of January 1, 2019 this year. So if you've previously uh, had a divorce or separation agreement in the past, you're grandfathered in unless you modify the agreement and expressly provide the new rules of no more alimony uh, deduction to be, uh, uh, unless you expressly provide that that should apply. But what hasn't been talked about as much along with the alimony repeal are the changes to section 682, which basically repeals Six, the the TICTRA repealed 682, effective January 1, 2019. So what does this really apply to? And it applies to anyone or any taxpayers that have done trusts between spouses. So these things have different names like lifetime Q-tips or spousal lifetime access trusts. Oftentimes these were done for estate or gift tax planning purposes. They might have been done as part of pre or post marital agreement planning to protect, let's say, a closely held family business. And these were done in the past, but the problem is that these are technically what are you would call grantor trusts. Grantor trust means whoever set up the trust has to pay the income taxes on the trust. The problem is after divorce, there's a question of whether or not they are still considered grantor trusts. There are several sections in the tax code. Uh, The big one is section 672E1 capital A. And what 672E1 capital A deals with under the grantor trust rules is it says that when a grantor sets up this trust, he or she is treated as holding any power or interest held by that grantor spouse at the time of the creation of such power or interest. There's a couple other sections in the code, such as 674D, 677, that really look at not just whether the grantor had certain rights or powers over a trust, but whether the grantor spouse had certain interest rights or powers. And the problem is the code and the regulations aren't clear about what happens after they get divorced. And in fact, the IRS and Treasury asked the question too in notice 2018-37. And they basically said, why or is a grantor trust, why would it still be a grantor trust after divorce just because they were spouses at the time they created the trust? Now, this used to never be an issue. No one really cared about it because we had this special section 682 that was repealed. The reason we never cared before is because section 682 simply said, look, if you have a grantor trust and the spouses get a divorce, we're not gonna make the grantor keep paying the taxes on that trust, that the former spouse who's the beneficiary, that person should be required to pay the taxes on whatever he or she receives. 682 made a lot of sense. It basically said, let's just tax the person who's actually getting the money after a divorce. But with the repeal of section 682, we have a really awful situation where you have a grantor, a wealthy individual, who might have set up a trust for their spouse 10, 20, 30 years ago, and if they get divorced, that grantor could be on the hook 
for all of the income taxes on that trust for the rest of his or her life, regardless of the fact that all of the income might be being paid out to that person's former spouse, the grantor's on the hook. Now, um, AgTech has written some comments, uh, uh, two different ones, one asking for sort of a legislative solution, basically saying, look, can we at least grandfather trust that were in existence prior to 2019 and say, look, this was the rule at the time, 682 applied. Can't we at least say that those trusts are safe and should get the benefit of 682. Um, the ABA had resolution 102A, uh, started with the family law section. It had help from some great individuals in the real property trust and estate law section and taxation section, where it was asking for legislative uh, solution to, well, first, don't repeal the alimony deduction and section 682, but even if you're gonna keep that repeal, at least grandfather pre-existing trusts. And by the way, can we also grandfather pre-existing premarital agreements and postmarital agreements. Um, and then what ActTech also did was it offered some comments on this whole, what we call spousal unity rules, section 672E saying, look, can we just say that, yeah, it's a grantor trust when you created the trust during marriage, but if the only thing that was really making it a grantor trust is the spouse's interest, and that person's no longer a spouse, can we go ahead and just say that it's not, not a grantor trust anymore because they're no longer married? So we're hoping for some changes, but in the meantime, what do you do with these trusts that are out there? Well, there are some potential solutions. One, the grantor might be able to release certain interests or powers that could be triggering grantor trust status. That could be, let's say, such, a, such as a section 675 swap or substitute power. Maybe if the grantor releases that, it will no longer be a grantor trust. Maybe you could get rid of the spouse as a beneficiary. Maybe you could amend the trust. Maybe you might be allowed to decant the trust depending on the trust agreement or state law. Um, third solution, maybe you wanna just dissolve the trust altogether and just give the spouse whatever is left in that trust. And the last solution is uh, maybe after the divorce, you wanna keep the spouse as a beneficiary, keep the trust going, but you're gonna have some kind of agreement that that spouse beneficiary has to reimburse the grantor for the taxes that that grantor has to pay as long as that the laws are the way they are. So that's what's going on there, but I did promise you another creative solution, and that is how can trust be your friend in a divorce? So we already know the alimony rules went away, no deduction. We know section 682 went away, so we can't have spousal trust created during divorce taxed to the former spouse. But what about using non-grantor trusts as part of the divorce process? There's two great code sections in the divorce that allow you to transfer assets income tax-free and gift tax-free. Those two sections are 1041 for income tax purposes and section 2516 for gift tax purposes. And the transfer doesn't have to happen before the divorce or as part of the divorce, it can happen after the divorce. And what that means is theoretically you could agree to create a trust after your divorce, it's still income tax-free, it's gift tax-free, it's going to be pursuant to a written marital settlement agreement. And by creating that non-grantor trust, what that means is we don't have to worry about the alimony rules or the grantor trust rules or section 682. You're basically creating a non-grantor trust under the regular subchapter J rules. Now I teach a 10 week LLM course covering the non-grantor and grantor trust rules, but to put it simply, by creating a non-grantor trust, the grantor will not be on the hook for the taxes of that trust. And all of the income that that non-grantor trust generates that is actually distributed to that former spouse, the former spouse will pay taxes on it just in accordance with the normal subchapter J rules. We don't have to worry about the income tax on the transfer 1041. We don't have to worry about the gift tax issues under 2516. We don't have to worry about the repeal of section 682 in the alimony rules. And the reason why it's kind of a way around alimony is the grantor setting it up does not get a deduction. It's not like an alimony deduction, but because the income that that trust generates is taxed directly to the former spouse, the grantor doesn't have to pay taxes in the first place, which means the grantor doesn't actually need the deduction. So that's just one creative solution you can consider, and hopefully we can have some resolution, at least grandfathering pre-existing trusts, let alone pre-existing premarital agreements and postmarital agreements. And with that, thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Justin. Thank you for educating us on tax reform's impact on trusts after divorce. Thank you for listening to this episode of AgTech Trust and Estate Talk, the podcast about wealth planning matters from the American College of Trust and Estate Counsel. To find an AgTech lawyer near you, visit ACTEC.org. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or a review at iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at AgTech Talk.